How can we use oyster biology and physics to improve restoration? Part 4, Oyster Biology and Chesapeake Bay Physics. Hi, my name is Elizabeth North, and I'll be talking about how we can use oyster biology and physics to improve restoration. Why use knowledge of oyster biology and physics to help restore oysters? Well, it helps us focus efforts on spawning success and target optimal areas for spawning. This allows us to maximize our limited financial resources and identify cost-effective solutions. What do we know about the physics of Chesapeake Bay? Well, we know that there are large differences in salinity. Salinity, or the amount of salt in the water, varies from zero near the head of the rivers down to almost 30 near the mouth. We also know that salinity changes between years due to differences in river flow. So here in July 2002, it was a low flow year, so there was a lot of salt in the bay and the salinities were high. In July 2003, now pictured here, the salt was pushed out of the estuary by the freshwater flow, the high flow that came in through the rivers. Here's salinity in July 2005, and you can see again that the estuary has changed. We also know that surface waters tend to flow downstream from the rivers to the ocean, and this is important to keep in mind when we discuss the larval stage of oysters. So what do we know about the biology of oysters? In the upper left is a movie of a male oyster spawning and a female releasing eggs. The sperm fertilizes the eggs externally, and they turn into veliger larvae, which spend about two weeks floating around in the water in the plankton. And once they develop a foot, they become a petty veliger, which swims down towards the bottom and searches for suitable habitat on which to cement itself, where it will remain the rest of its life and turn into a juvenile oyster. We also know that oysters grow faster and die from disease sooner in high salinity waters. In low salinities, you may have a lot of oysters that grow very slowly, and the females might not be able to reproduce until year three, but you have a lot of oysters by the time you get to year four. In high salinity waters, the oysters grow very quickly. The females may be able to produce eggs in year two, but you might not have many left by year four. Here are maps of Chesapeake Bay with different salinities in a low flow year on the left and a high flow year on the right. On the left, you can see the pink region indicates where there's high disease mortality for oyster adults. On the right, you can see in a high flow year that the fresh water pushes the salt out of the bay, reduces salinity, and makes this region of high disease mortality for adult oysters much smaller. Another fact of oyster biology is that oysters start off as males and become females as they develop. If you had a bunch of oysters that were 2 inches long, only 27% of them would be female. A bunch of 3-inch oysters, only 44% would be female. And a bunch of 4-inch oysters, 61% of them would be female. We actually harvest oysters when they're 3 inches long. And when they're 3 inches long, that's when the diseases hit the worst. So the consequences of that is that disease in harvest selectively removes females and makes it hard for oyster populations to reproduce. We also know that large females produce millions more eggs than small females. A three inch oyster will produce 30 million eggs, but a four inch oyster will produce almost twice that, 55 million eggs. We also know that oyster larvae do not develop in low salinities. On the left, we can see the low flow year where there was more salt in the estuary and the region pictured in orange of low development for oyster larvae is much smaller than the region on the right during a high flow year when the low salinities during high freshwater flow push down the bay and make the region of poor development for oyster larvae larger. Another fact of oyster biology that we know is that larvae need appropriate habitat on which to settle. So if larvae are spawned from a reef, spend about two weeks in the plankton developing as larvae, and then turn into petty villagers, they swim down and try to find a suitable reef, and they don't find hard habitat on which to settle, they'll eventually die.
So we know that oysters need multiple reefs for larvae to settle on. We also know that upstream reefs can supply larvae to downstream reefs. Here, the upstream reef spawns and the larvae are carried in the tides and downstream. Some settle back on the original reef, but most settle on the reefs downstream. The next reef spawns, the larvae are carried around. A few return to the reef, but most go to the downstream reefs. The downstream reef spawns, and most of the larvae are carried away from that reef. A few settle back on that reef. So it's the upstream reef that actually has the highest transport success, the highest success of larvae being transported to another reef. We can use computer simulations to estimate transport success throughout Chesapeake Bay. The results of the computer simulations indicate that some reefs are in a good location for transport of larvae to other reefs. Here in this image, you can see the reefs that are color-coded orange, pink, and red have high transport success scores, indicating that 70 to 100 percent of the larvae released from these reefs could encounter another reef to settle on, if they don't die of predation, disease, or starvation first. So now that we know facts about physics of the Chesapeake Bay and biology of oysters, how do we apply what we know? Well, we know that oysters die from disease in high salinities, but the larvae do not develop well in low salinities. So we can take our maps of the low flow year and the high flow year and outline the regions that are risky for larvae and risky for the that looks like it's good for larvae and good for adults. This is the high survival region where we'd expect in any given year the salinities to be okay for larval development and also good enough that adult oysters have a decent chance of beating disease. So we also know that larvae need habitat to survive and that some reefs are in prime locations for larval transport. So if we take our map of larval transport success and then overlay the high survival region on top of it, we end up with locations that would be optimal to protect and restore for increasing oyster populations, where we have high larval transport, good survival for larvae, and decent survival for adults. We also know that bigger females produce more eggs, so how do we incorporate that into oyster restoration? We can create sanctuaries with no harvest and optimal locations where reefs can grow with dense clusters of males and big old fecund females. The females will produce many eggs, the larvae have a chance to develop in good salinities, and the adults won't be as susceptible to disease. These areas would be excellent for restoring oyster populations in Chesapeake Bay, and in fact, Oyster sanctuaries are currently being located in these optimal areas. For example, the Harris Creek Sanctuary has all the characteristics of good population growth, and we hope that this sanctuary and many others will help jumpstart oyster populations in Chesapeake Bay and restore them to thriving levels.